we have been talking about um, meditation and we've been talking about uh, shamatha and um, vipassana. And um, this is part, uh, when we talk about vipassana, we are talking from a Mahamudra point of view. So from this uh, Mahamudra point of view, Gampopa says that, um, uh, you know, the practice of Vipassana uh, begins with uh, shamatha, and uh, it is uh, a path to liberation. And that's what we're uh, putting all these things together. And first we begin with shamatha as our foundation. We look uh, with Vipassana, uh, we look directly at the mind. And there are five stages, really, uh, for this uh, uh, practice. So just to, to clarify a little bit about our meditation practice, uh, we're working with the body, the speech, and the mind. But of these three, as I mentioned before, the mind is mo most important. So the attention to the mind is called mindfulness. And this is the awareness of the present moment, what is happening right now. And through these practices, we are training our minds to live in the present. But there are five paths, um, and I'll mention those briefly because they are all related and are part of the progress on the path to our liberation. So we begin with the path of accumulation. So this is uh, the path of merit. We are doing good deeds. Our progress in the path, again, uh, is the cultivating of both merit and wisdom, but uh, our wisdom is a little more gradual, but there is something uh, in us, uh, our Buddha nature, that drives us in a particular uh, direction. And those of you who are here, it is not by accident. There is an internal drive, motivation, intention uh, to wake up. So in that process, there are moral aspects as well as uh, mental ones and uh, our practice, uh, as we say, is body, speech, and mind. The mental part of the meditation part is mind, but our actions in our everyday life um, is also very important in how we generate merit, our actions toward ourselves and others uh, through our body, speech, and mind. So this, um, the first stage of the path uh, that is talked about in our journey to enlightenment is uh, described with these five paths, the path of accumulation, which is accumulating merit and uh, the path of uh, application or juncture, which has to do with the application of our, uh, our practice. We're applying ourselves to the practice, causing it to be imbued with a certain motivation and intention. And in the beginning, it may be slightly fabricated because we don't have the, uh, the wisdom but uh, as we were saying before, we kind of fake it until we make it through the variety of practices that are uh, part of the uh, Vajrayana and part of our Mahamudra uh, journey. So the path of accumulation starts it, the path of application, the path of vision or seeing. That is really where things begin to accelerate. This can also be uh, really the first Bodhisattva Bhumi, where we see emptiness clearly. We have the direct experience from our meditation, and we are starting to clear up the obscurations that prevent us from uh, uh, seeing the truth. Uh, we usually live in a dualistic world, self and other, and we take these things that we perceive through the senses, um, uh, the eye the consciousness, the uh, seeing, the ear consciousness, hearing, the, nose, consciousness, smelling, et cetera, we take those as real. And as we progress along that path, we see them as uh, dreamlike. They are not uh, solid. They are uh, a conglomerate. And, uh, you know, like uh, at the scene of the crime, you can have uh, five witnesses that see something and they all see something different, where it's uh, not exactly the same because we all... Uh, have these senses that are imbued with causes and conditions and 
qualities of the, uh, the sense organ or our perceptions and how we interpret these things. So we have to understand, distance ourselves a little bit from this experience and see it as uh, uh, dharmakaya, as empty as any essential real aspect, this duality uh, that we generally uh, perceive things uh, based on, again, causes and conditions is, uh, is uh, somewhat warped <clears throat> and affects our, uh, <coughs> excuse me, affects our, uh, our consciousness. So the idea, yes. Um, I had the, the good opportunity to meditate during fireworks last night. Yes. And, and that was, that was really perfect because it was, it was sort of, um, these loud sounds would come up and disturb me momentarily and then they would fade and um, my breathing stayed the same throughout. And it was just a kind of a really good, um, analogy for me during that meditation to do, to, to experience that. Yeah, generally we say to find a, a, a quiet place, but really, if your meditation is uh, uh, proceeding, you know, you could be in the middle of downtown Manhattan and be the center of the, the hurricane, uh, unmoved, solid, adamantine, like a mountain. So that is a good uh, example of how you can let those, it's sound and emptiness, you just hear it and gone. But the problem is, generally, we uh, hear it, we make a... Um, uh, a conception of it, uh, wonder what kind of uh, firecracker that was, or it reminds me of when I was a kid, or and our mind just uh, goes off. So that is a good example of uh, being present in the moment. And these um, the sounds and uh, feelings, emotions, are uh, they come and go. And we can just uh, return to the present. That is part of the present. That is, uh, that's good. Any other comments or questions about uh, those, uh, the path of accumulation, the path of, uh, you know, accumulating merit and the application, that is a good application. You know, we're starting to uh, get deeper into our practice without uh, distraction, as it says in our uh, Mahamudra lineage prayer, distraction is the body of meditation to be undistracted. That's why we say in the beginning, to be in a, a quiet, safe kind of place so that uh, we limit our distractions. But distractions are gonna be there, often they come from our own mind, but uh, outside sounds, those kinds of things, like you say, Chris, uh, can disturb our meditation, can. Not necessarily, but they can disturb our meditation. But it is good that you can have that stability without being distracted. And you just return your awareness back to the um, the focus or the subject of your meditation, which is usually the breath with the shamatha. Any other comment? Okay. So the, the first, we had the first, we had the second, and the third, we said the path of seeing. And this is... Uh, really where we begin to directly see emptiness and uh, the nature of the mind. It says in the sutras that it takes incalculable eons uh, to come to this uh, place of seeing. However, in the Vajrayana, that is not the case. Um, you know, with the right uh, student, uh, who applies the, uh, has the right application and has the right teacher. And, you know, we, we had been studying the Mahamudra lineage prayer, which is really a pointing out instruction about the nature of the mind. With these things, uh, it doesn't take uh, many lifetimes. You can uh, attain this realization of emptiness in this very life. So we can achieve direct insight into the nature of our mind in one lifetime which is incredibly uh, fortunate, you know. Uh, that's why we say the Vajrayana is like the rocket ship, of uh, the sciences, the mind sciences of meditation. So the path of seeing, as I mentioned, is kind of like the uh, first Bodhisattva level, which is great joy. That is the, the name of this Bodhisattva level, great joy. And, uh, but we can't usually sustain it. 
uh, in our day-to-day -day life. But having that first glimpse, and then we accommodate it more and more, we rest in it more and more, we uh, make it more our experience, and then it becomes uh, more a natural way that we see the world in this non-dual uh, dreamlike quality that is um, free of uh, attachment, free of clinging, free of ego, and all of the desires that uh, go with that. So that's uh, when we really uh, start accelerating that. And the fourth one is just meditation, is to continue to deepen our meditation practice and experience that level of uh, joy and emptiness and non-duality. The essence of meditation is uh, this uh, non-distractedness, yes, but uh, non-dual aspect. Seeing samsara and nirvana as uh, the same. It is a state of mind. And the fifth of the five paths is, is no more meditation. We've achieved the state of stability as a Buddha. So uh, meditation, formal meditation, is not required. It is just a state of mind that uh, we rest in continually without uh, interruption, without distraction. That is the mind's nature, and we are skilled in this meditation. And it simply continues. And we can do that. Then the Buddhism is very realistic. You know, it is. Uh, uh, it sees we see the world as it is. This is the practice of the pasana. So uh, we had we had talked about um, the shamatha as the foundation, and then uh, the next part of that is the uh, pasana. So that are there questions about the pasana? In the, the Vajrayana, or in this Mahamudra uh, way of looking at it, is somewhat different than you may see it uh, given in other texts. But this is uh, the way we're looking at it uh, based on our uh, teachers and uh, the Mahamudra view. All phenomena is really one thing, you know, uh, it is based on our ignorance that we see it as uh, divided or, uh, or dual. As we say, the nature of the mind is just clear awareness, and uh, we want to rest in that uh, clear awareness, luminous clarity and emptiness. Those are the two aspects, luminous clarity and emptiness, and that is the foundation of the mind of enlightenment. The union of appearance and emptiness, sometimes it's called the union of appearance and emptiness. Sometimes it's called the union of bliss and emptiness. Like we were saying, the first bodhisattva level is called the joyous, or the blissful, because uh, that is the state of the mind in clarity and its brilliant uh, display. Okay. So um, the next aspect, you know, when we talk about meditation, again, we're talking about the eight uh, kind of petals of this golden uh, lotus that we're talking about for health and healing. And we're starting with meditation as the, the first foundation, the first branch of this. And then we're going to go on to uh, the seven other branches. But I want to make sure that we have our, our meditation part clear, because this is the foundation of uh, the healing practices in Asian medicine. We have the good fortune of making it our primary practice, no matter what we do. But when we look at Asian medicine, there are uh, different aspects that were in the sutras or in the, uh, the writings of uh, whether it's Chinese medicine or Tibetan medicine, or Asian medicine in general always starts with the uh, thesis of uh, clarifying the mind. And we have the great good fortune of having uh, this path available to us when we talk about meditation, the Vajrayana, and uh, the uh, uh, teachings of the Buddha. So uh, walking meditation is another aspect uh, that is complementary to our sitting. 
And it is the same with their sitting. When we're sitting, just like anything else, you know you're sitting. We've gone through the um, different aspects of the sitting, you know, starting with the legs and the shoulders and the back and the eyes and the hands and the tongue and the head. So we can go through that uh, uh, sequence uh, when we uh, put our bottoms on the cushion and then have our practice. But often it's helpful to at least discuss walking meditation. Many of you probably don't do walking meditation, but it is a compliment uh, for our sitting practice. We're used to sitting, and if we feel dull or bothered by pain, instead of stopping, uh, our meditation, but we can just uh, combine it with a walking practice. This gives some exercise as well as uh, increases or uh, wakes us up a little bit and improves uh, our clarity of mind. So the body uh, it gets a little rest from the sitting and helps the mind become clearer. And it is all, you know, one of the other aspects for the um, walking practice is that it's, it helps in post-meditation. It's more like our daily, daily life. And of course, we want to be practicing uh, meditation 24-7, not just when we're on the cushion. So our post-meditation is also important. And uh, as we do the walking meditation, we can employ it or you practice it uh, during the day, not that we're gonna be walking slowly like you would in walking meditation, but we do have a movement, we can be mindful, we can be conscious of our movement and make it like a meditation, just like when we're eating, we can make it a meditation, just like when we're washing, we can make it a meditation. What makes it a meditation is our mindfulness, our being present in that activity and not just uh, basically unconscious. It gives us more uh, momentum into our day-to-day -day life and bridges the formal uh, practice and the informal practice. It can be an important step. So in, uh, just for the completion sake, we'll talk a little bit about the walking meditation. The sutras don't... Uh, specifically uh, describe where your hands uh, should be and, and how you should walk. Uh, from a physical point of view, we have your hands swimming, you know, swinging when you're walking. We're not gonna, you don't do it like that. Um, instead, a uh, contribution towards uh, tranquility of mind, uh, hold your hands in front of you in a, uh, you know, uh, right hand and left thumbs gently touching around the navel or if we say the dantian, that point four finger wisp below the navel. Uh, or you can have the hands interlaced and over your abdomen uh, when you walk like that. Those are, are two commonly used. I like the uh, one that uh, in this mudra of equanimity, right hand and left, thumbs gently touching at the uh, navel or dantian. In, in the martial arts, we call it the dantian. Uh, there are three dantians here, uh, heart and lower dante in the movement center. So because we are moving, it also brings awareness to that movement center. So the hands, uh, right hand in left, right hand on top, thumbs gently touching as uh, you see the Buddha uh, Amitabha sitting in that uh, posture, or often you'll see the Buddhas in that posture of equanimity. You can hold the hands like that. And, uh, uh, would you like to see me just do walking meditation? Or are you good with it? I'd like to see. Uh -huh. Like All right. Um, uh, I will turn the camera around and uh, see if I can uh, do it. So bear with me for a moment and we will arrange that, if that is the case.
I want to try to get out of this. Let's see. Be good if you could see my feet. I'm not sure you're going to be able to see me exactly, but you'll be able to see the hands. Everyone see okay? Yes. Yeah. All right. So, uh, hands on the uh, lower dantian. You can extend, just have all the weight in the uh, right foot, extend the left foot out, heel toe, lay the foot down empty, it's empty. Don't put any weight in it, then shift the weight. 100% in the left, pick up the right foot, just heel it up, heel first, then toe, place the heel down, then the foot, shift the weight. So we have the weight in the right foot, we're picking up the left foot, it's traveling, 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 right heel down, left foot down, still empty, place the weight. You're going to do a little bit faster than this, but just for clarity, shift the weight 100%, pick up the empty left foot, bring it forward, shift the weight 100%, heel up the right foot, come forward, moving through space and shift the weight. So once again. Extending the left foot out, laying it down, shifting the weight. Now we'll do it in kind of real time. It doesn't have to be a long step. It can just be a heel in front of the, uh, the uh, toes in the back, like that. And then uh, if you're walking uh, in a hallway or something like that, it's cold, it's rainy, and you want to do your meditation, generally we walk in a circle. But sometimes uh, if you walk down a hallway and you want to turn, the way you would do that is when you, you're walking, Bring both feet together, turn the right foot to the 90 degree, bring the feet together, turn the right foot to the 90 degree, bring the feet together, and then begin again. So that even the turn is conscious and uh, in line with the same pace. Any question? So you generally you're going to have a, enough room that you can walk around in a circle or walk a distance, turn around and walk back. You can do that for 5, 10, 15 minutes. I'm going to set this back again. Okay, any questions about that? Walking meditation. Not so difficult. But an, an important uh, in doing the walking meditation, again, it is just uh, a complement to your sitting practice. And again, you, you walk uh, first lifting the heel upward and then uh, putting the rest of the foot down, shifting the weight. It's not toe heel when you when you step. It's heel toe. Heel touches the ground first, then the whole foot, and take a moderate step. 
And if you're walking, generally walk around um, in a clockwise fashion, clockwise direction, as you would around the stupa. And walk with moderate steps and moderate pace. If you move too slowly, you lose your balance. And this requires a little practice. I mean, it is, we're not used to walking slowly. And sometimes we think, oh, uh, you know, you're just clumsy and uncoordinated, but uh, continue to do it. And uh, you'll get a nice, uh, see what the right pace is for you. Not too fast, not too slow. And let your awareness be on the feet. So uh, when you're moving the foot, you're aware of peeling the rear foot up, stepping forward, laying the foot down, shifting the weight, and just be present like that. Lama, it's, it's very interesting that, um, to see your presentation because uh, when I was still in upstate New York, uh, a rolfer that we did some sessions with taught me a way of walking very similar and he he suggested feel like you're massaging the the, the planet with each footstep like really feel your footsteps and then uh an acupuncturist that i saw in warwick new york uh taught me um, meditative walking it was exactly the you know it's very much the same so um Thich Nhat Hanh teaches it like that as well uh that uh Imagine you are massaging the earth. So he, he just brings that loving effect uh, that you're loving the earth, caressing the earth with your foot. And it's a light step, you're not clumping down. That's why you lay it down empty. I don't know, we think of elephants as being uh, kind of big and clumsy. They are not clumsy. They are really very um, adept at when they lay their foot down, you know, they, they they know where it's going and they don't put weight in it until they feel like it's safe. Um, so my Tai Chi teacher was, uh, was called Little Elephant by his um, Tai Chi teacher, Cheng Man Cheng. Um, because, uh, you know, that's, uh, your, your step should be light. He was a very big guy, by the way, not elephant size but uh, big size. And uh, so he had, he, he taught that, that way to have that lightness of movement. And there's a, a Tai Chi, um, what's called uh, the uh, um, walking on thin ice. So the, the, you imagine, you know, you're walking on thin ice and before you lay the foot down and put weight in it, you want to make sure it doesn't crack underneath you. So there's lots of images that are used um, uh, with this practice. But I think you get the gist. Uh, we're, we're bringing our awareness, we're bringing our consciousness uh, to our walking and to our feet. Any other questions? Okay. So the uh, last part of our um, meditation portion of the uh, Golden Eight Petal Lotus of Chinese medicine is, uh, or Oriental Asian medicine, is Tonglin practice. And I just want to mention it briefly because that is another practice where we cultivate uh, a loving kindness and compassion. And we briefly begin uh, our, our practice of a bodhisattva uh, and cultivate this uh, bodhicitta with the practice known as Tonglin or sending and receiving. So the Bodhisattva Sutra uh, says to give yourself to others and contains stories of how the Bodhisattvas and Buddhas in training, uh, who gave everything, even their lives, uh, when it was necessary to benefit others. Uh, we're not asking you to give blindly in that way. We are being asked to give uh, when and what we are ready to do. So to get the highest uh, level of giving, giving all, we must first learn how to give. And this, uh, we have to make a habit of letting go and detaching ourselves from self-clinging. So this is uh, one of the aspects of Tong Lin as well, the practice of letting go. 
the main practice uh, for developing this letting go, you know, is the Tonglen or sending and receiving. So the practice of Tonglen is very simple. You sit in meditation posture, breathing normally. Then think you are inhaling, that you are taking, when you're inhaling, uh, that you are taking on all the negative karma, illness, misfortune, unfavorable conditions of all beings uh, into yourself. And when you exhale, you're sending all virtue, merit, excellent qualities of yourself to all sentient beings. So this practice uh, minimizes and gradually uproots the conflicting emotions and engages us physically, mentally, verbally in developing tolerance, kindness, compassion. This explains the expression, enlightened beings have reached enlightenment by working for the benefit of all sentient beings. Sentient beings remain in samsara because they are working for themselves alone. So this is what uh, separates the uh, um, Shravakas, Prajaka Buddhas, um, the, from the Mahayana practitioners, is that we extend our wish that all beings attain uh, liberation. By letting go, we work to benefit others, rather than working merely uh, to benefit ourselves. Okay, question uh, about that before we uh, talk a little bit more about Tonglen. Lama, I just wanted to, to uh, mention something you, you said so, some months ago that was really helpful in this department, which is to, when you're doing the inhalation, taking on uh, all beings' karma, um, visualize it as a drop of water hitting hot coals and, and instantly vaporizing. Uh, that, that was very helpful for me. Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of people, their first thing is, oh, I, I can't take in that yuck. It's going to make me sick. It's going to uh, make me feel bad. And that's the last thing we want to do is feel bad. Um, but this is uh, the uh, practice of thinking of others above ourselves. And you really can't, uh, you won't affect yourself negatively in this way. Uh, I, we usually say when you take it in, you transform it. You change it uh, into uh, uh, positive things and send it back out again. But that uh, visual of taking it in and uh, it evaporates uh, like hitting a hot coal, that is also fine. And this can be done for uh, anyone, anything, uh, it can be done for your pet. It can be done for someone who is uh, needing special <coughs> prayers for whatever reason, in sickness or a difficulty that they're having. Uh, we can do Tonglen for them if they are suffering, if we know that they're having difficulty with that situation. Out of our compassion, we can do Tonglen. And it can be done anywhere, anytime. I think I mentioned before that I was uh, on a plane when you could fly, um, and uh, next to me in the aisle across from me was a mother and her child who was crying, and she was upset, and uh, the, the mother was upset, the child was upset, everyone around her was upset with this crying child, and I, was, I had compassion for her, I could feel what she was going through, and I uh, was doing Tong Lin, and it, it didn't take long, and the whole situation just uh, pacified itself, child calmed down, that everybody seemed to be okay. I'm not saying that my Tong Lin made that difference, but it did happen like that. So we have that compassion. We have loving kindness for those who are suffering. Uh, I've done it with people who I saw yelling, uh, you know, on a car next to me. When we stopped at the red light, they were obviously angry and yelling. And so Tong Lin, I don't know how that ended up, but every, uh, there's many opportunities for the practice of Tong Lin in daily life. Basically, when we inhale, we say, may I take on the other suffering, and when you exhale, may I give others you know, merit and happiness. And if, as we accustom uh, ourselves to that, it can be done anywhere, anytime. It's part of our mindfulness practice as a bodhisattva to benefit beings 
You know, we want all beings to experience happiness. So first we apply mindfulness. The moment we're aware that uh, we're experiencing anger and other conflicting emotion, we can think, may I experience this neurotic emotion that all sentient beings experience along the way, and may all sentient beings be free of that neurotic emotion. So we can use it as uh, to purify our own negative emotions as well. Uh, when we have uh, something that has come comes up and in that way we neutralize it for ourselves and we make it our prayer to benefit others so that that uh, when we talk about merit with the, uh, the first uh, path of accumulation we are accumulating merit and then as we um, progress through that and actually cultivate loving kindness and compassion we are expressing um, this uh, uh, attitude of the bodhisattva and gradually becoming the bodhisattva as a result. Although the emotion we may be experiencing is not positive, uh, the way you handle it is positive by recognizing it, by purifying it, and transmuting it uh, for the benefit of all beings. And that is our prayer. You know, that may this negative emotion I'm feeling, anger, jealousy, pride, uh, be of benefit to all those who experience similar emotions. You can accept, you know, that the, the negative emotion and uh, the confusions that come from our negative emotions, transmute them and uh, make them, make it a meritorious thing, not a negative karma for yourself. So in short, we make it uh, a habit to think of other sentient beings' welfare and practice accordingly. And as I said, you can practice anywhere, everywhere, when you're doing anything, whether it is uh, the taking a shower, eating, dressing, whatever, you can say, I dedicate the merit of my activity for the benefit of all beings. That is, uh, that can be considered Tonglen. You know, even if we're, we're doing uh, sleep yoga, uh, lucid dreaming, so even we can take it a step further and say that even in our dreams, um, we can transform sleep into practice of virtue. If you go to sleep thinking, I will help living beings, your sleep will benefit living beings. Just having that intention, it's like when you take a vow, you know, uh, we may take a vow that I will not kill. You know, that's uh, one of the first of the lay vows. Taking the vow is important. You know, we're probably not gonna kill anybody, but with that vow, we actually uh, generate merit by not killing. Uh, by honoring that vow, we accumulate merit. That's why the, the lay vows um, are so important. Not stealing, not lying, not committing uh, sexual uh, misconduct, and not uh, taking um, uh, drugs and, you know, uh, subverting your mind and uh, opening yourself up uh, to possible negative consequences as a result. All these things, when we take the vow, then that uh, vow is another agent for our uh, meritorious activity. We actually gain merit when we honor the vow. And we may not kill anybody if we don't have the vow, uh, but we don't get the merit. If we honor our vow, that is meritorious. It's our intention, it's our motivation. And that is very important in any, uh, anything that we do. What is our intent? What is our motivation? So in short, again, you're making the habit to think of other sentient beings' welfare. And you dedicate the merit of your activity for the benefit of all beings.
you know, we, we appreciate being on this planet and being with other people since we need to have a technique for accumulating merit in everyday life. Even if we can't sit down and practice, we can present, uh, if we can be present in this moment and think of others, we're practicing. We, it's not just on the cushion. So if we enjoy a meal and we think of sharing the joy with others, that is practice. In this way, our activity of everyday life can be practiced. That is mindfulness, that is awareness. So we train ourselves by thinking, praying. If something makes me happy, may all beings share in this happiness. If I meet circumstances of suffering or frustration, may my frustration eliminate the sufferings of all sentient beings. This is a skillful way, you know, that the Buddha taught us. Uh, to cultivate virtue and practice loving kindness and compassion towards everyone equally. As we say, having the same great love for all. That's equanimity. Okay, questions about anything that we have uh, spoken of or practiced today? So, of course, the other the thing, uh, you know, we're talking about practice, doing your yidam practices, um, whether it's uh, Chen Rezi, Medicine Buddha, uh, a variety of skillful means that cultivates this uh, merit. And also wisdom is uh, not only our, our sitting practice, but um, the yidam practices, meditations that we've been doing and we will continue to do to cultivate this uh, merit and wisdom. KTD, as you know, has been doing um, practices, uh, doing Medicine Buddha on Saturday last night. Um, at Kempo Ujjan and Kempo Sanjay uh, presented the, the uh, Medicine Buddhas, the brother Medicine Buddhas, um, he's been uh, teaching on that. They also are uh, doing Chen Rezi practice. So if you have the time, um, you can see the schedule on the KTP site uh, to listen in to those uh, teachings or practices. That is time well spent. Have any of you been doing that? Tonight is Medicine Buddha practice. Uh, Eight o'clock, I believe. Um, uh, so they go through the entire Medicine Buddha uh, sadhana. So, as the Buddha said, there are only two mistakes that uh, you can make in the practice of Dharma. Uh, so those two mistakes that uh, one can make along the road to the truth are not starting and not going all the way. So we don't want to be guilty. We've started, but we have to see it through. And not going all the way is the second mistake that we can make in the practice of Dharma. Well, that completes our uh, discussion of meditation as the first of the eight branches of our study. Of course, we could go a lot further than that. Meditation is just something that uh, 
is ongoing. But I think next time, um, as I mentioned, again, the eight branches that we'll be talking about are meditation, uh, self-cultivation is the first. And this is the first of the trainings taught in the training of a physician in uh, Asian medicine. The next one is uh, Qigong um, or Tai Chi. And next time we will talk about uh, Qigong. And the third is the diet and nutrition. We will have that discussion. And then um, some massage or acupressure. I'll give some points for health and healing. The fifth is the I Ching or Mo. And um, the sixth is Feng Shui. The seventh is medicine. And the last is uh, acupuncture. So we'll talk about the five element application, uh, which is all encompassing in terms of diet and nutrition, and, uh, exercise, and um, how we take care of ourselves from that Asian perspective. So those are the eight, uh, what I call the eight petals of Asian medicine. And we've completed the first.